on this study and, and visit to us with him, Mr. Abdurrahman Mustafa and His Excellency Dr. Abdulaziz Al-Hur, the Director of the Diplomatic Institute at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And <coughs> our welcome is extended to all uh, our participants and followers through our webinar, through the Zoom application. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the restrictions, we had to restrict the number of attendees this evening and uh, we do not have the authority, in fact, to have a public invitation, so therefore we had to restrict the number and we have a number of distinguished uh, diplomats and uh, uh, we hope that you all have the interpretation headsets so that uh, you can listen to the translation if you need it. Uh, our invitation to Dr. Nasser Al-Hariri comes as part and parcel of our program uh, uh, to invite personalities directly to uh, speak to us directly and we had before Dr. Al-Hariri, Dr. Ashraf uh, um, Ghani, the President of uh, Afghanistan, His uh, Highness uh, uh, Prince Hassan of Jordan, and other personalities, including Mullah Baradar, uh, one of the political leaders of the Taliban movement. And please allow me before anything to say that uh, our center was established in 2016. We provide a multidisciplinary programs of study and uh, to an attempt to understand conflicts and humanitarian work in the re in the MENA region and the surrounding uh, region. We try to combine both the theoretical and practical aspects in the hope of uh, contributing to solving problems. Uh, our speaker today will speak on the on-the-ground realities and political consequences of the situation in Syria amid uh, uh, important uh, developments in the region and at the international level with the arrival of President Joe Biden to the White House about uh, a month ago, and we are only weeks away from the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution, 10 years full of uh, suffering, conflict, uh, and during which we witness an unprecedented uh, situation with millions of Syrians having to flee the country. Dr. Nasser al Harir, he is the president of the National Coalition of the Syrian uh, Revolution and Opposition Forces. He is uh, a physician uh, by training and practice, uh, and uh, he spent years in, in the medical profession in both Damascus and Dara. Then he gave up uh, medicine to engage in politics and he headed the del Syrian delegation of the opposition forces to the Geneva talks in 2017. And uh, he is a member of uh, different uh, committees and medical syndicates and unions. He still has some interest in medicine. We are honored to have Dr. Al-Hariri with us and uh, to provide us with the latest impressions he has gathered about the situation in Syria and what he uh, foresees in for the future in the few months. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nasr Al-Hariri. 
Good afternoon to you, doctor, and thank you very much for this introduction and beautiful words in in the introduction and our thanks and appreciations to all those who have taken the uh, uh, who, who to take part with us. Our thanks go to our uh, brothers and sisters at the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies. And we know uh, what wonderful work they do, and we are all, all hope that we'll continue collaboration with them. Um, am I supposed to... Uh, first of all, have some introductory remarks, opening remarks. Yes, you will have 20 minutes for your opening remarks, then we will move forward. The Syrian uh, dossier is not the only major issue. We have other major issues in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Yemen, and uh, other countries who and some countries who on the face of it appear to be calm and stable but uh, th that's only on the surface and there is a simmering fire of uh, conflicts to come and yes uh, we are only weeks away from celebrating the 10th uh, anniversary of the Syrian revolution. This is an anniversary which makes us feel both uh, proud and in pain because after suffering for decades at the hands of the uh, Assad regime, both by Assad father, the, the father, Hafez, and the son, Bashar, who had no regard whatsoever for any uh, human rights. So in that sense, it was a moment of uh, pride. Yet we always strived uh, throughout the last years uh, to minimize the cost in bloodshed. The bloodshed, we, 14 million Syrians have had to uh, flee the country and uh, migrating or risking their lives uh, at sea and some of them ended up in the bottom of the sea in the bellies of fish uh, sacrificing their lives for the sake of freedom in fact the Syrian people renew their oath of allegiance to the revolution and we have some um, uh, aspects that we have to take into account. If we look at the political side of things and the international involvement, we'll see, as is the situation with other conflicts, we can safely say that the current prevailing policy is a policy of no solution. Nothing so far has been done really in order to achieve a decisive settlement which can open the doors uh, before the Syrian people for peace and stability. We had nine rounds of talks in Geneva and five rounds of the work of the Constitutional Committee after a year and a half of its launch and about 15 rounds in, at the Astana platform without achieving really any noticeable uh, progress. As for the political side, uh, in order to say there is a political process, in fact, some certain conditions has to be there. First of and foremost, uh, the UN sponsorship, we have uh, uh, um, two uh, relative uh, resolutions of course. And also, secondly, we need political sides in the, Syri in the Syrian conflict to 
need to be committed to the solution. And I can safely say that the revolutionary forces have always uh, committed themselves to peace and worked diligently to achieve it. Unfortunately, nothing materialized. Unfortunately, the regime, and right from the first moments of the revolution until now, have really rejected any uh, peace opportunities. They, opportunities. they rejected the Arab uh, uh, initiatives, whether at the bilateral level or at the level of the Arab League, and they also rejected the Kofi Annan initiative, they rejected the regional initiatives until we got to 2021. The regime still banks on a military situation. They keep uh, engaging the world, uh, pretending to be engaged in working for peace, yet everything they do continues in the direction of a military solution aided by Russia and Iran. The third uh, pillar of uh, any political process is the international community and work to achieve that. We see a clear uh, division. It's as if each country is dealing with the Syrian dossier, not from a collective point of view, but from a, in, an individual point of view, sometimes through consensus with other countries and more often than not uh, individually to the point that sometimes we can see a struggle and strife between the other countries because of Syria. All of this leads us to conclude that a political sol solution is f far away. Some Syrians even go as far as saying there'll never be such a political solution. So therefore, the first con conclusion, we can say that for us in Syria, we cannot expect in the foreseeable future any aspect of peace. Secondly, some are hoping that there will be an international uh, environment to bring about a peaceful solution. And therefore, this because this can happen any minute, therefore, the Syrian people should be ready for that. And we are working on that and working to achieve the relative United Nations Council's resolution and also for the transition period and the new future constitution. We also have our vision for that ready and by the will of God we are willing and prepared for a parliamentary elections as is called for by the relative uh, UN resolutions. The third point I would like to talk about, if there is no political so solution and nothing happens and the, uh, the status quo uh, continues to prevail, uh, we have to remember that uh, the regime and the areas under its control have been really suffering. They've been very fragile and the system has been very fragile, but uh, uh, Iran and Russia have been maintaining it and giving it uh, the impression that it's still alive. There is another region which is under uh, the uh, Kurdish forces, uh, the, uh, and we, so far as we are concerned, we are committed to uh, fighting terrorism uh, represented by ISIS and represented by the the workers revolutionary the the PPK the Kurdish Revolutionary Party uh, Kurdish Workers Revolutionary Party and the terrorism of Iran and the militias backed by Iran. The coalition we represent 
and uh, which we have a transitional government made of seven ministers and we control an area with around seven million people uh, living under our control and the area and the population is continuing due to the migration of uh, people who are moving from areas under the control of the regime and the problem we have is we don't have much of uh, uh, resources and uh, like uh, providing the basic services, peace and stability, fighting the sleeping cells and active cells of terrorist organizations, and also developing the role of the, the uh, temporary government. Therefore, when we say that there is no political solution and we need to be ready, we need to use uh, our strengths uh, on four pillars. Uh, the first one, the northwestern areas of Syria, by providing a centralized administration that provides uh, the needs by giving uh, support and empowering the uh, transitional uh, government and this is actually uh, ne this actually needs the support of the Syrian people and the uh, other friendly countries and here I would like uh, to recommend the state of Qatar for the role it's playing in addition to Turkey the EU and the United States of America and as you know Turkey is directly involved uh, when it comes to all issues in a strategic alliance in order to support the ambitions of the Syrian people. The uh, second uh, axis is uh, the uh, northeastern parts of uh, Syria. And uh, these, uh, this area has several factors to be taken into account. There's a intra-Kurdish dialogue under the uh, supervision of the United States uh, and unfortunately this dialogue uh, so far did not uh, re uh, lead to anything uh, because uh, Qasad uh, want to continue to be linked with the PKK and have their relations with uh, the PKK and have their separatist uh, agenda. The third one is the regime controlled areas they suffer from two main things the first of the first is that the regime failed to control these areas this reinforces or reiterates uh, the fact that uh, this regime is collapsing and is supported or sustained by foreign forces so we can see in Dara in the south, for instance, the uh, rallies and the protests uh, and the military uh, operations against regime forces and such uh, operations take place in other areas as well, uh, like uh, also Sueda, etc. The second factor is the huge economic collapse and the lack of uh, food security, famine and the diseases uh, uh, that are spread and the fact that these challenges uh, cannot be faced by the regime and this embargo is actually imposed by the regime of Syria in order to uh, suppress and oppress the people of Syria. The fourth one is actually the international uh, aspect. We need to be represented uh, at the level of uh, the opposition, the uh, commission for uh, negotiation in order to avoid uh, allowing any party to use justification and we need to work with the United Nations uh, even if the results so far have been disappointing and we also need to preserve other factors of strength such as the isolation at the political and diplomatic level of the regime and avoid uh, any uh, normalization uh, with the regime and using sanctions like Caesar and other sanctions uh, used by states and facing the rhetoric of the regime uh, that is saying that these sanctions are affecting the Syrian people. What is affecting the Syrian people is the mismanagement of the regime, its failure and its use of the country's resources in order 
to use the military equipment against the Syrian people. And at the same time, the assistance from the international community is ongoing and all medical and services assistance is exempt from the sanctions. And also we need to continue working on facing impunity and holding people accountable. Do these factors uh, uh, or are they considered enough uh, in order for the regime and its allies to get to a political solution? The answer is no. Iran has a project in the region that goes through Damascus but does not stop there. There is an expansionist project by Iran and we all see it in Arab and non-Arab countries. Russia had an opportunity that it didn't have even during the days of the Soviet Union maybe and achieved several interests through this failed regime who could not say no. How could this regime say no to Russia? Russia is the party that supported this regime and controls the resources of Syria. And the third one is that the leverage cannot force them to go to political solution. We need to work on other factors, especially that the regime uh, will hold elections in July as if nothing is happening in Syria. And the most important thing is to tackle the legitimacy of the Syrian regime. From the perspective of the Syrian people, this is an illegitimate regime. One million martyrs uh, were killed, 14 million were displaced, and millions refuse its presence, but they are oppressed in the regions controlled by the regime, supported by the Syrian military, or by the Russian military, sorry. And the regime cannot play the role of the provider of services to the Syrian people and at the same time uh, bomb the civilian areas. And at the same time, there are other er uh, areas that could be used in order to put pressure on the regime in order to reach a political solution. And maybe unfortunately, however, the U.S. policy that uh, needs to lead the efforts of the international community that decided to support the movement of change in the region to include the Syrian people's movement to reach results. So as Syrian people and other countries suffered from the no policies policy, no solutions policy, and some other countries resorted to individual uh, steps in order to achieve uh, their interests uh, uh, that intersect with the Syrian people's interests in order to wait for these solutions to arrive. How can we reach solution in Syria? Of course, we recognize as Syrians that the Syrian dossier is not only Syrian and it is not only Arab and it is not only regional and it is not only global. The Syrian issue is Syrian, Arab, regional and international and until the Syrian people live in peace at the end of this long tunnel there needs to be an understanding at all these levels and I think that the best level to start with is the upper international understanding and uh, at the level of the Security Council their latest briefing was really clear uh, he actually uh, summarized the entire uh, uh, political process it was disappointing, which means it failed. And uh, when he talked about international effort and uh, he's saying, I will not be able to do anything should we uh, not uh, uh, reach an international driver in order to reach this political solution. And the efforts of the Syrian people alone are not enough. It is to say that this criminal regime that hindered the solution for 10 years and that the change of four envoys, uh, so uh, we're talking about the fourth envoy after Anan, uh, Ibrahimi, Demistura, and now Peterson. So this regime that impeded everything uh, cannot contribute to the solution and this is why the international community needs to adopt a clear cut policy to impose political solution and not try to convince the regime and I think that this is part of the mandate of the Security Council uh, and uh, we need to remember that the article uh, 21 
and the Security Council resolution talks about Chapter 7 measures should the regime violate the agreement. And the regime did indeed violate not only one, but all conditions, uh, the arsenal, the stockpile of chemical weapons, and the Syrian still uses the chemical weapons against uh, dissidents and also uh, loyalists. Uh, and we remember in 2019, the al Khalidiyah attack in Aleppo, where the regime used uh, the uh, chemical weapons against loyalists in order to accuse or try to accuse the opposition. And uh, we also have several details. In order not to uh, bore you, we will wait for the questions and the interactions. I am ready, doctor. Thank you so much. I think that uh, I was within the uh, dedicated time. Thank you so much. And that was actually a very comprehensive uh, coverage of uh, this issue. <laughs> you are welcome as a professor at our institute at any time. Let me begin this uh, discussion. So you tackled the issue of the need to resort to measures better than what is happening now and the chapter seven that was mentioned. Unfortunately, in this region and uh, all over the world, this reminds us of what happened in Iraq. In your opinion, what uh, the opposition did so far, uh, what did the opposition do to uh, reassure the Syrian people and also the region that we are talking about this time smart options and efficient uh, options. So are there ideas at this level? For instance, when we hear sanctions in our region, we remember what happened with the Iraqi people during the previous uh, sanctions. And now the problems have become deeper with coronavirus and with poverty. All these things are on the rise as opposition. Is there any vision? Are there any ideas at this level? And could we have a phase between the use of force to uh, talk to people interested in the Syrian affair in order to raise the level of services and the welfare of the people? Of course, it is a key question. We have been hearing for 10 years that we do not want from countries uh, that remain silent vis-a-vis uh, -vis the crimes of the regime. We do not want a repetition of the Libyan or Iraqi scenario. And very objectively, we can see that our brothers in Libya, despite all the suffering, they are way better off than the Syrian situation. Because when it comes to the martyrs, we have one million plus martyrs. So Syria, out of 22 people, lost one and out of 22 people 14 outside the country and the seven eight individuals remaining if you look at videos for instance you would see one dollar equals three thousand four hundred uh, lira or pound so a professor a university professor's salary is thirty dollars the prime minister in syria his salary is 70 US dollars. So just imagine taking into account the inflation, the size of the humanitarian calamity in Syria. So it is true that there is no worse situation than what Syria is encountering today. So this uh, agreement uh, uh, through the Geneva a statement and the Security Council had the countries of the world uh, used it smartly and uh, they uh, or the opposition could have uh, prevented uh, or the countries could have prevented the uh, some of the catastrophes. The United States uh, are uh, present in the northern areas of Syria for instance but was this presence not uh, a deterring factor from a military uh, victory by the regime? And what about the Turkish presence, although it is criticized? But this intervention was coordinated with us as Syrian people. So what would have been the fate of 
this area had this alliance between the opposition forces and Turkey not happened. Five million people, where would they be? M maybe refugees or living in regime controlled areas, torturing, killing, poverty, unemployment, economic crisis. We all remember that in 2013 when the regime used chemical weapons against the Ghouta and the UN delegation was a hun some hundred meters away from the targeted area. There was a red line that was crossed during the Obama administration days. When the regime saw that there is a collective international effort that could be used against it, we saw indicators of a collapse and it was reflected by conceding and offering concessions when it comes to the chemical weapons. And you remember uh, that the regime had these slogans about the balance of power or force and uh, deterrence and resistance. So all these slogans were forgotten and uh, the regime offered concessions. Uh, that were not offered to the people of Syria. When it comes to humanitarian assistance, we have worked and uh, uh, any country implementing sanctions, we work on the details of the details in order to make sure that medical and uh, humanitarian assistance is exempt from these sanctions. And at the level of the coalition, uh, we uh, have Mr. Abdel Majid. There's a group that follows up uh, Caesar law uh, issue or Caesar, Caesar Act issues. So we have sanctions targeting the officials and regime members, but uh, without tackling or without targeting a humanitarian assistance. And in our continuous international communication, and we know that these areas are suffering, we have highlighted several issues. The first one, any assistance through the UN distributed through the regime, uh, th these uh, we have a big question mark vis-a-vis uh, -vis this assistance. Why? Because the regime gives loyalists uh, and does not give dissidents. Uh, and the regime is selling assistance in order to get hard currency and finance military. And also they found the UN labeled assistance, uh, they found it in the camps of regime fighters. So maybe the benefit out of these, uh, uh, this assistance uh, is maybe 1%, 5%, 4%. This is why we need alternative mechanisms in order to guarantee the fact that uh, we have the assistance uh, targeting uh, the people without these obstacles. However, the sovereignty of the Syrian Republic needs to be preserved. Uh, this is what is being said. So not a single political uh, operation is to be done, but through the regime. This is what the regime wants, but it is impossible to achieve the result because we have highlighted the negative aspects of how the regime is dealing with this. So we do not believe in the military solution and we do not want the military solution to be to be the only option. And uh, uh, we cannot allow uh, this uh, political uh, solution to continue uh, throughout uh, uh, or for a lifetime. And the objective sometimes of negotiations is actually just doing negotiation without any results. So for instance, uh, at the level of medicine, we used to say, take this medication for uh, a week. Some diseases need uh, four months treatment, uh, maybe one year. Uh, maybe some uh, chronic diseases uh, need like uh, lifetime uh, medication. But we need to have a serious approach vis-a-vis -vis the political process or else the international intervention would reappear. For instance, Daesh, ISIS, and uh, Tadmur carry out, carried out several attacks. We said since the very beginning, we cannot find a solution to the ISIS problem unless we uh, find a solution to the uh, resources of the regime. We cannot tackle negative 
aspects uh, that went in parallel with the revolution, refugees, terrorism, etc. We cannot face these things without a political solution, just and fair solution, sustainable solution through the UN Security Council resolution. So we need to use all uh, measures, not only soft diplomacy, in order to find a solution. So I would like to ask you, thank you, Dr. Bell, I would like to ask you, uh, some things uh, because uh, it is important to delve in the details. If you think about it logically, the international community, the interests uh, of the states of the world are different. Of course, some policies are based on humanitarian needs uh, and uh, sympathy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the conflict in Syria, but the decisions uh, are made based on strategic interests, uh, as you have said. Maybe terrorism is uh, uh, one of these interests, maybe stopping terrorism, stopping refugee waves. And in your uh, lecture, you talked about uh, the terrorist cells uh, that remain in some opposition-controlled areas. And the regime, one way or another, used this point as a pretext for a long period of time. What is your approach? How can you deal with this? And how could this be part or could it be part of the plan in order to encourage uh, the international community to give the important uh, or the priority uh, to the Syrian issue? Terrorism in Syria was a challenge at different levels. Uh, for instance, any uh, environment where we have chaos, these are appropriate uh, conditions that lead to ideologies, whether we're talking about terrorist ideologies or other ideologies, because every party starts uh, supporting and uh, trying to push uh, its own agenda. So ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda, PKK, the regime and its allies, the terrorist groups are challenging at two levels. It targ uh, it, the first one is that it targeted this terrorism, targeted the Syrian people. So many assassinations, many attacks carried out by terrorist groups against the people revolting. Most of the attacks avoided Iran and the regime forces. Can you give me one example of a terrorist attack that targeted Iran throughout the 10 years? Not a single one in 10 years. The second level is that terrorism was used as a pretext either to make the allies of the regime uh, fight against the revolution under the pretext of terrorism, or some of our friends also uh, gave us away because of this pretext. So the question is, if the international community is capable of leading an international coalition to fight ISIS and announce victory against the, uh, ISIS and the Ba'uz uh, uh, war two, three years ago, would this international community not be able to face uh, these terrorist groups that were classified internationally as terrorists? PKK, for instance, Hezbollah, the Lebanese, uh, fighting days uh, and uh, day and night uh, uh, in Syria. Hezbollah is a terrorist uh, organization, but it was not attacked, it was not targeted, and some countries actually, uh, on the contrary, dialogue and negotiate with Hezbollah as part of the political process, not only in Lebanon, but also in Syria and in Iraq. And our approach was clear from a political stance. We reject, refuse any terrorist group on Syrian soil carrying out any attacks or activities. Is it enough? No. We fought very hard battles. We lost martyrs we, in different Syrian areas. We paid a lot. And we offered, and we still do, through our fighters and through our political institutions and the uh, legitimate recognition we offer to be part of any alliance that leads to fighting terrorist groups in order for the regime not to benefit from these uh, conflicts and these uh, attacks because the regime is benefiting to bomb the people with barrels, explosive barrels and chemicals 
and saying, I am fighting terrorism. So this shows that this is a loop where uh, you have uh, regime oppress oppression that leads to poverty, terrorism, and it feeds uh, on itself. So as you have said, uh, doctor, uh, the it's a must to have an international uh, agreement. Uh, the U.S., Russia, the EU, Israel, and Arab countries are important. And there are different positions. So in order to reach this international uh, understanding, uh, what can we do in order to appease or please uh, Russia? What does Russia need uh, when it comes to the future of Syria with you? And uh, also, uh, there might be another question. As opposition, you still believe that uh, uh, there is a role of mediator maybe uh, based on your description uh, you see it as or we're talking about russia now so can you see russia as a mediator or could russia play a role because uh, wh what does russia want basically well the worst of choices uh, doctor is uh, that we have countries uh, whose interest is the no solution. And this is what we are feeling. So, for example, when talking to any country, uh, we need to hear their interests and our interests in order to reach a solution. But if the state interest is a no solution because the solution for this country means losing the gains or the benefit that was accumulated for uh, 10 years. This is the problem. The second point is that we need to distinguish. Are we uh, talking about uh, the beginning of a negotiation or the end of a negotiation? So uh, had it been the end or the objective, we could have uh, dialogued with Russia. Unfortunately, we discovered that Russia is using the Syrian dossier and Bashar al-Assad particularly in order to negotiate in other areas. And this is complicating the situation because you have the uh, points uh, of negotiation that you want to tackle, but you cannot control the other aspects, like, for example, the uh, Security Council, the presence of NATO in Ukraine and uh, Crimea and Belarus, uh, all these things are complicating the issue. And it becomes even more complicated when Russia feels that even within Syria, the regime uh, provides uh, the interests of Russia more than any other party. For example, Russia has economic interests, uh, the port, uh, uh, gas, and we're not talking about military occupation, but a gradual economic occupation through which uh, Russia controls the resources of the country, and nobody maybe can achieve this other than the uh, regime. So Russia tried to present itself as a mediator and as a guarantor of the political process. When you observe the behavior of Russia, you see that its behavior is anything but uh, the uh, neutral mediator. Russia is uh, totally in favor of the military solution. And uh, the, they're saying, for, ex for instance, we support the legitimate government, we fight terrorists, Syrian people do not have a problem with Bashar al-Assad, and they left because of the groups. Uh, so uh, uh, countries of the world, we should unite and start the rebuilding of Syria and let the other uh, solution wait. The veto was used maybe 18 times at the level of Security Council. The president of Russia, Putin, talked about 200 uh, 
65 weapons tried in Syria, and we had good results, and our um, uh, soldiers actually uh, had good results and were trained, and this ha had positive outcomes for us. And uh, we did not take Bashar al-Assad uh, interest uh, into account or the people of Syria, only Russian interests. This is why we say negotiations with Russia is a must because Russia is present on the ground and everybody recognizes this and negotiates with Russia. However, when it comes to this role, Russia cannot be a mediator or a guarantor of any political process and when it comes to counting on the Syrian regime, Russia will be mistaken and Russia is gradually you, uh, losing uh, one uh, uh, dossier at a time in Syria. So uh, the last question before moving to uh, the uh, Q&A from the participants. So it seems that everybody is negotiating uh, on other issues through Syria. Do you see with the arrival of, uh, do you see the, uh, or some hope with the arrival of uh, President Biden? Uh, maybe uh, there was some sort of communication with the U.S. administration. The uh, communication with the U.S. administration is active, and we think that the U.S. administration has a key role in Syria and in the region. Until now, uh, we do not know all the appointees uh, in Syria or in uh, the U.S., sorry, in order to understand, uh, better understand the uh, U.S. administration uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria. We met a Syrian delegation, or sorry, a U.S. delegation, and uh, uh, Mr. Biden did not tackle the Syrian issue. Some people say Syria is implicitly present uh, because uh, this is a dossier that is present uh, throughout. Uh, and some other people say this is a bad sign. So we have many points in common with the United States, and the United States is leading the international community that was uh, called uh, the uh, friendly nations. Uh, and uh, we agree with the Americans when it comes to the war on terrorism, expelling Iran, facing the uh, Iranian influence in the region, and also uh, a, a political solution based on the UN Security Council and uh, uh, starting the rebuilding of uh, Syria and also the partnership when it comes to the uh, facing of impunity and uh, accountability, etc. We have points of disagreement when it comes to the support of uh, Qasad in uh, the uh, northern parts of Syria and we hope that the United States uh, will uh, play a better role in order to reach a solution and puts uh, an end to the uh, terrorist uh, uh, group in the region. The second dossier is uh, uh, Iran's. We fear any nuclear deal, whether the original one uh, or if they put together a new deal, and this is what we don't accept, maybe they will go back to the same deal and uh, uh, with some modifications and uh, we saw in the past that uh, when Iran got uh, millions of dollars the, the millions of dollars were spent on destabilizing the region uh, especially Syria and the third concern is the no solution policy we have tried the democratic administration the democratic administration did not reach a clear uh, political solution and the same thing uh, applies to a Republican administration. The fear, or our fear in addition to what was mentioned, is uh, seeing a continuation of this uh, management of the Syrian issue without leading the efforts uh, at the international level in order to reach uh, a real uh, political solution with the implementation of the uh, Geneva Statement and the uh, resolution. Uh, so um, we will begin uh, getting your questions uh, if you are with us uh, on Zoom. Please raise your hand and I will give you the floor. Dr. Abdelaziz.
Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz Al Huk from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation. I have two questions. The first question is when you talked uh, throughout your lecture about the political solution in Syria and not a military solution, even if we say there is a political solution, uh, we need to be able to negotiate uh, and we need to be able to use force in order to impose some uh, things. Uh, so what are the position or the elements of strength? The second point is that we are witnessing a withdrawal from uh, the United States, uh, whether we're talking about Democratic uh, Party or Republican Party. So uh, we have uh, uh, well-defined uh, U.S. policy when it comes to the withdrawal of the region and uh, the U.S. is headed toward uh, Asia and uh, China. So uh, could you also uh, count on the uh, U.S. Uh, administration in order to uh, have a solution, especially as you have mentioned, you have one million martyrs and uh, 90 percent of the territories of Syria are distributed on different parties. You only control 10 percent. So could we consider the U.S. Uh, uh, factor that could be counted on uh, in Syria? Thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz. Uh, thank you so much. I agree. Any political solution needs uh, points of strength uh, in order to uh, force the other party to negotiate. Uh, so the representatives of the revolution uh, have strengths uh, internally and regionally and internationally. When it comes to the self-strength, uh, uh, I do not want to be emotional, but this is the truth, and I am proud to say uh, this is the will of the Syrian people. And you can uh, notice with me that despite everything, uh, despite all the atrocities, the Syrian people still have this will. We are not happy to see this, but we are saying that in spite of everything, the Syrian people did not accept reconciliation with this regime because they know the uh, problems uh, of uh, this regime more than any other party. This is why the Syrian people did not accept uh, reconciliation. So this is not uh, an emotional and uh, basically political correct uh, uh, statement. If you go to camps, if you go to talk to refugees, if you uh, talk in Azaz, in Al-Bab, in Afrin, to people. We see them on a daily uh, basis, uh, and we hear that uh, they believe in the revolution, and their intention and their will is even more than before, because every time the Syrian regime commits a crime, uh, we become more determined to put an end to it. And also, when it comes to the positions of strength, uh, we can talk about the institutions of the revolution and our institutions that we created to offer services to the uh, citizens. And uh, for instance, the uh, uh, Syrian embassy in Qatar. Uh, we always commend uh, the state of Qatar. And uh, uh, we know that in the embassy here, regardless of the political positions of Syria, the Syrian citizens can get the services. And this is unprecedented. When it comes to the regional uh, positions of strength, we uh, can say, thank God, the regime is isolated at the regional level. The regime is absent. Sanctions are uh, putting a lot of pressure on the regime and also countries uh, documented the uh, crimes committed by the regime, the economic sanctions through Caesar Act, etc. And the UN Security Council and the uh, Geneva uh, process. And also I have mentioned an example from Dara, from uh, Suwaida. So if the 
Syrians in 2011 had 1,000 reasons to revolt. Now in 2021, the Syrian people have 1 million reasons to revolt against the same regime and the allies of the regime. And today I can send you on WhatsApp some footage from Tartus, for instance, from Latakia, from Suwaida, because after famine, after poverty, the lack of security, famine, no medicine, nobody has anything left. So there is a problem between the people and the regime. When it comes to the withdrawal of the United States from the region, I would be uh, I wouldn't be objective uh, unless I say all the allies uh, of the United States have suffered from disappointment. And uh, there is some, uh, uh, or this relationship is not at its best. And uh, uh, I have heard this repeatedly. The U.S. administration did not uh, commit to or uh, implement the uh, pledges. So, uh, the Syrian people uh, feel uh, disappointed uh, sometimes. But is it enough to say that the United States does not play a role? No. The United States is a key uh, country supporting the Syrian uh, dossier reasonably. And we are waiting for the United States to play a leading role to find political solution. When it comes to the U.S. policy in the region, uh, we know that it's not only about Russia and China. We know that Israel is a priority. This is why I think that uh, the U.S., whether Democratic or Republican, uh, cannot uh, actually uh, do away or forget about the Syrian <coughs> That the basic principles that the United States is keen on whether to do with its own national interests or the interests of its allies in the region. And we and, and we see that the United States is still present in northeastern Syria and refusing to withdraw. Does this mean that we should expect this major role to be played by the United States to close or uh, dossiers and issues, we can't say that. We are keen on the American presence in Syria, but what is disappointing that this role did not uh, rise up to what was expected. The entire region is suffering today. Maybe th the, the biggest suffering is in Syria, but look around and you'll see for yourselves. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Khaled Abu Saleh. He is with us on Zoom. Mr. Khaled Abu Saleh. Thank you, Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ask me, please, Khaled. I'll pass on the question.
Muna Hidaya. I am from the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies. Thank you very much uh, and welcome to our center. Regarding your question, uh, what you said about the worst scenario being that most of the countries that you rely on for a solution, they themselves do not want a solution and their interest lies in a no uh, resolution situation. In that case, what, what uh, alternatives do you have if you cannot uh, bank on the international community, although it's the only feasible, really, situa this uh, solution. So what other countries can you rely on, basically? If we can take more than one question, it will be better, then you can respond to them all. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Yusuf Al Mulla. I am a researcher at the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies. First of all, have you established any funds to contribute to the rebuilding? And uh, secondly, are you subjected to any political pressures when you get any aid from outside? Thank you very much, Ms. Muna, first. Uh, uh, maybe the most important countries that see that uh, a no resolution is the best and the only resolution should suit their own interests are Russia and Iran. There are other countries which are either uh, um, neutral in the Syrian conflict and they see that peace and stability in the region is much better for everybody else. And I doubt whether there is any country in the world which has not been touched negatively by the conflict in Syria. For example, the European Union, by and large, are suffering from the question of uh, illegal immigration and immigration which has become uh, a hot political issue in all countries and led to social upheaval or some forces within European countries are trying to exploit this issue to further their own political interests. The second point, Turkey. Turkey has borders with the Syria for more than nine, 916 kilometers. They suffered an at, um, attempted uh, military coup d'etat. Uh, the PKK was rejuvenated to cause problems for the Turkey. Any neighboring country, whether we're talking about Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, they all see that it's in everybody's best interest to see peace and stability prevailing in Syria because it's in everybody's interest. So therefore, do these countries have the tools at their disposal to impact the situation so much so that uh, a solution can be uh, found? Of course, this depends. Uh, what remains at the end of the day a lack of uh, collective leadership. And unfortunately, that's not there. In our opinion, only the United States is capable of playing such a role. But the others, of course, can influence and impact the situation with varying degrees. The absence of the United States has led recently to some initiatives here and there. For example, Russia wouldn't have uh, initiated uh, some attempts at a solution like uh, finding an alternative to uh, uh, Geneva track if it wasn't for the absence of the Americans. The United States has uh, the important cards it can play. Other countries really need to work jointly with the United States for any of their efforts to bear fruit. Uh, Mr. Yusuf's question, there have been many 
donor countries uh, organizing uh, conferences. Some uh, donor countries have fulfilled their promises. Some uh, did not, unfortunately. As for the rebuilding, this is still is faced with some red lines because this cannot be achieved without a political solution based uh, on uh, the UN Resolution 2254. And we support this position and uh, we confront those countries who try to use this scheme of rebuilding and rehabilitation without a political solution. We think any attempt at rebuilding now in the absence of a proper political solution or solutions can only play into the hands of the regime and sustain the regime. As for the transitional government, unfortunately, uh, Despite the area that we control has at least 5 million Syrians living in the area, they are uh, mostly uh, children, maybe 55% of them, and they are mostly uh, internally displaced. I know of one country who have been displaced 17 times. You know if you move house, you spend three months uh, suffering from the impact when you have everybody, you have uh, uh, removal, people uh, moving all your furniture. But imagine if under the current unsafe uh, conditions, a family has to uh, leave its uh, home for 17 times. Unfortunately, the only active support we get is from Turkey and uh, Qatar and some international organizations, but the, most of the countries in the world do not support us, unfortunately. We hope that a people like ours who have suffered this much deserve uh, more attention and maybe we, in the near future, we see more efforts. Uh, please allow me to ask you, the, uh, uh, the rebuilding policy, does it, uh, is, is it, do you extend that to the areas under your own control too? For example, you have uh, a government with seven ministries. How can they do their job without uh, rebuilding? The other point is the areas where Turkey has a pres presence, I think they are doing some rebuilding and they're trying to attract people to return. So it's in the interest of the people. I agree with you entirely about the prevailing political conditions, but people need to feel stable. Maybe they can spend the next 10 years under these conditions. With the, this is the question of the chicken and the egg, isn't it? Yes. For, for, for example, if you cannot have a bicycle to, to move around, it's very unlikely you start imagining that you can get an aircraft one day. So first, we focus on humanitarian aid. Secondly, we know the hospitals are destroyed, schools are destroyed, the road system, the judiciary. So we need to re-stabilize the region. Also, we need some developmental projects. We don't want the areas to continue relying on aid. Number four is rebuilding, but our slogan is we should do that with a political solution. But if a, can, if a regime goes on committing all these atrocities, and uh, a calls for, rebuild, for rebuilding, 
this will be used to legitimize the regime. For our areas, we, we, we want the rebuilding for our area, but we don't want that to be at the expense of sustaining the regime. Of course, we will try and do some smart rebuilding in our areas. The world knows very well who is the perpetrator of the crime and who is the victim. And it's not really fair for both sides to be treated on equal footing. Of course, if, if we have rebuilding without the regime benefiting from that, this is wonderful. We have a question. I don't know. We go back to Zoom now. And Mr. Khalid, we'll see if it works or not. Thank you very much, Ibrahim Al Khatib. With all due respect, um, people can try, but you should have alternatives. As, as you said, <laughs> you cannot go on treating a patient uh, with painkillers if there is a chronic condition. Uh, we, must, we must think of alternatives if we reach a dead end. When you talk about uh, rebuilding in the liberated areas, as you call them, now we are faced with this difficult... Uh, are you thinking of building an army for this... Uh, uh, area to to protect the people and defend the people is this something your coalition is thinking of uh, number three we really need to achieve a breakthrough internationally we cannot uh, bank on that uh, uh, without a strong uh, a domestic uh, front like for, ex for example, the regime doesn't mind when Israel uh, attacks, uh, bombards uh, Iranian or other targets within the country, and they continue supporting the Syrian Democratic Forces and others. So can we really hope of any stability and try and work out a solution uh, using any points of strength if there is such and finally the situation requires uh, first and foremost um, a reliance on the Syrian effort and not on any outside force. Thank you. Uh, this is a question similar to one of the questions we received uh, through Zoom. What is your vision, what is your perception about any solution what is the solution, in your opinion? Uh, what you said, I agree with you entirely. Uh, the, the movement which started in some countries like Syria, the beginning of the revolution, was an internal thing. It, in fact, uh, made the entire world pay attention to it, and then there were some mechanisms, there are some initiatives, the Friends of Syria, the Geneva track, etc. Anything opposite that will not do. If we wait for the outside world to come and reorganize our movement, this will not work. So therefore, the Syrian revolution has a chance now, after 10 years, to set its sights on its own internal resources. And I'm sure that if the national coalition and the 
transitional government started working on the Syrians themselves and organized internally and built a unified military force, a unified police force, unified judiciary, unified utility services, electricity, water, etc. This will not go unnoticed by people near and far away because this will focus the attention of the world. Uh, well, people used to say that Syria is different. In fact, we know that for a fact that everybody else's interests are uh, 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 meet, they meet each other in Syria and they overlap in Syria and uh, and the, the most important thing is the leadership of the revolution is back inside Syrian territory. And you cannot really lead a revolution from outside with all due respect for the countries who supported us. We have to build the real partnerships based on joint and mutual interests. And today, when we talk about institutionalizing everything, the National Army, which was announced some a year ago, and the prevailing condition was different faction, factions and factionalism, and the Syrians realized that this will not lead to success, so we announced the formation of the National Army, and I say that we have reached a lot. We cannot say that we've reached the end, but uh, we've come a long way and we Syrians are continuing in exerting our efforts and we're relying on our uh, faithful friends and we really hope to establish a formidable force on the ground which will enable us to go into any negotiation with, strong, with a strong hand. Now we are ready for negotiations. We are ready and the, uh, the political choices are clear. If this is not available and feasible, we have alternatives and this regime cannot continue to exist in the way they imagine things. Before there was a narrative that the war was over and Assad has achieved victory. It was not like that. The war hasn't ended now. At least 42% of the Syrian territory is outside the control of uh, uh, the regime. And we are talking about the 42%, which is uh, the vital part of Syrian territory where all the oil and gas and other resources are there. If it wasn't for the Russian and Iranian presence, uh, they would have collapsed. And no people of any country can rely on outside powers forever. They are standing on a broken wooden leg sustained by the Russians and the Iranians. In, in there was uh, uh, in 2016 when it was announced that uh, there was readiness for a political solution with establishing uh, an uh, elections, parliamentary and presidential elections, a new constitution, and uh, th this was an international formula supported by the UN and the representatives of the Syrian people accepted that in order to put an end to the bloodshed. Unfortunately, the regime did not accept that. We have in our right hand the political track and with all what it entails, in our left hand the army, the plow, the hospital, the pen, the schools, everything to build. This is our alternative until God grants us victory and the Syrians go back to their country. We are running out of time. I still, 
I still have many questions. Maybe you can take a couple of questions and with our apologies to the others. A question which says uh, the, the, the opposition has different platforms and this is what distinguishes the situation in Syria. Maybe this is not unique to Syria, but uh, what's your vision to unite the opposition forces and factions in Syria? And second point, or another question, about the situation of the refugees, especially in the camps. Some of them have started returning how, what's your position on that? Do you encourage or discourage refugees to return? First of all, the nobody can say that the exact number of Syrians who suffered, some say 22 million, some say 10 million, some say 11 Billion. So far as we are concerned, every free Syrian patriot uh, believes in our country uh, has really suffered and therefore people who are against the regime are co make up the opposition, uh, their numbers run in millions, so therefore you cannot represent millions of people by millions of people. But, I mean, people try to make excuses that the opposition is uh, in a disarray and they're not united. In fact, uh, uh, many people attempted to interfere. If, 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 if the opposition was weak, some said it needed to be strengthened. When they saw it strong, they said it should be weakened, and all these uh, attempts have been going ahead. If you, if you look at and com the situation and compare it to other countries, you will eventually see that people find uh, a solution. For example, Every time, every time a track fails, like for example, if the Geneva track fails, they say, ah, oh, the problem lies in the opposition. They do not say the problem lies in the Geneva track itself. They do not care if the regime refuses the solution. Of course, I mean, having said that, we do not deny and we should not ignore that the opposition makes mistakes and they should try to be a representative of the Syrian people at the widest possible way. This is one thing. But another thing is to use that against the Syrians. You know, the likes of Russia and other countries have always said there can only be one regime and, it, and it's there, it's present, it's at the table or can be at the table, whereas the, re, the opposition is not unified. And frankly speaking, uh, the, the, we have to admit that some refugees would never go back to Syria, even if there is a real uh, solution. So what about the regime still being there? There's a lot to be uh, talked about, and uh, the Russians and the regime have tried to convince Syrians to return. Of some people have believed that due to the harsh conditions they live in, and they have returned. But we have to remember that it wasn't only the areas under the control of the regime where refugees returned. In the northwestern area, under the opposition's control, some 450,000 people returned. Some who returned to the regime's areas were arrested, they were tortured, some were even martyred, and some who have been harassed, and they still are, they're really suffering. All of these uh, factors made that uh, the conference held in Damascus, held and organized by, by Russia, 
uh, and which was attended by some countries who do not have uh, any Syrian refugees. There are two aspects to this. First, a political one. Uh, no refugees can return to Syria without providing a, a, some stability uh, so that the refugee can go back to their native areas uh, without fearing any harassment or torture or imprisonment. Secondly, there is the humanitarian aspect, and which are the conditions laid down by the High Commission for Refugees of the United Nations, which makes any return voluntary, dignified, and the refugee decides for him or herself. And any violation of that is a violation of the international humanitarian law and incriminates the people who do it. And of course, the vast majority of refugees are either internally displaced inside Syria or outside it. They really know the regime very well, and they know only too well what will happen to them if they ever return. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al-Hariri, and thank you for your uh, uh, frankness. We wish you the best in Syria, everyone, and peace and stability soon to be prayed. Now Khalid's question, a long-awaited question has arrived. Uh, is he Khalid from Homs, our own Khalid, or? The Syrian regime has a plan based on a military and security solution, time wasting and not uh, giving any concessions and playing on the contradictions in the position of outside countries and the weakness of the opponents. So, so what is the plan by the opposition? I think we talked about that. First, uh, uh, believing in a political solution, work for it and prepare for it, but not to be fooled by it. We have uh, uh, alternatives in the northwest and northeastern part, uh, parts of the country, and we work to rally all the support we can. Of course, we have the right to rely on the time factor and when anybody who knows anything about Syria would realize that that uh, the regime cannot uh, play for time, rely on time. You know, when the Russian Air Force helped them to regain Al Ghouta, you remember the, uh, the what was the price of the value of the dollar. Now, years after its control, and the dollar now goes from 460 Syrian lira to more than 3,000 Syrian liras. So even for people who thought that time is in the interest of the regime, in fact, it's not. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Nasr al-Hariri, and we hope that we have an opportunity in the future to collaborate, especially if you like to uh, talk to our audience about uh, plans for rebuilding and smart rebuilding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for all our brothers and sisters who are present and all those who followed us. And we wish you the best of health and may God protect you all from this uh, pandemic and I pray to Almighty God that soon we will be in a position to invite you to visit us in Syria. Thank you.